you can't and if i don't if i don't hear you or if you don't if you don't speak up which you can you can unmute your microphone and ask a question if i don't hear you or see you uh you can hit the little hand icon uh and it'll put that next to your name and i should be able to see it and um that'll help me um to uh, catch somebody who has a question okay um, i'm going to record the session um just so that anybody who wasn't able to come today um, can uh, watch this at a later time, or you guys can revisit it if you want to, um, if there's any, any, any topics on here that you want to go over again, okay? Um, so <clears throat> I wanna start by uh, taking a look at the, um, the outline, and I'm gonna talk about, um, uh, the general overview of the topics that we had for this semester. Then I'm organizing my page right now as we speak. Um, I also want to um, maybe take a look at the decks if that's possible. What I'm going to do right now is um, open up the deck for, whoops, wrong class. Let's do this. Let's open up the intro. Let's do that. Okay. All right, and then I'm going to reduce that. Hopefully, I can show you all this stuff on the screen as I go from one box to the next. Okay. So, um, let me put down. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's see here. Okay. All right. I'm new to Zoom, folks, so please forgive me if uh, it takes me a minute or two to get my bearings here. Um, I used to use um, Citrix GoToMeeting, and so, you know, just when you got that figured out, they uh, hit you with a different application, and then you got to sort of very quickly adapt to the learning curve. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Okay. So I want to get this to where I can sort of see. That's probably good. Okay. So in section one, so way back at the beginning of the semester, um, we talked about um, the job of the cinematographer. We talked about uh, and the overview of the department. And then I asked you guys a question about what, how you would define cinematic. So in the past, what have we had now? 14, 13 weeks minus, uh, well, 12 weeks minus the holiday and minus, um, minus uh, uh, winter break. Um, we've touched on a lot of topics. We've talked about a lot of things. And I'm just curious if anybody has, um, if, if your um, idea about what makes video cinematic has evolved over the course of the semester, uh, does anybody have the same point of view of what they feel uh, cinema and cinematography are? Uh, and has anybody developed a new uh, notion of what cinematic and cinematography are? Does anybody have any anything to uh, to offer in that regard? Okay. All right. Well, hopefully, um, you've gotten a sense of what this thing is um, by by understanding that. Um, I think merely shooting video uh, at this point is something that sort of, we take it for granted. I think we, it happens at random. Like for instance, I think, um, I think our notions of video are, um, for instance, you know, you pull out your cell phone and, and you, you know, capture something that, you happen to be doing in that moment or, you know, something silly that your friend's doing, you know, at lunch or, 
um, you know, something you see uh, on vacation or, you know, out and about on your daily, uh, doing your daily routines, right? I, I, that's how I, I kind of think of, you know, shooting video or, you know, you, you shoot something, um, you know, maybe you uh, take a selfie, uh, you're out doing something or you're out at some location or some event and you just sort of, you know, you do a selfie um, so that you can put it up on social media later and you can show your, your friends and your, and your, um, uh, your fellow uh, YouTubers, for instance, or Facebookers, uh, you know, what you were doing this afternoon. Uh, these are the things that I think of when I think of video, right? So um, when I talk about cinema now, hopefully, uh, based on the things that we've discussed this semester, you guys will feel more like cinema is a sort of a deliberate approach to creating images and they can be with video technology. I mean, I consider all this stuff, you know, that we're using all of these devices. I mean, they're all shooting video now in some fashion. They're not shooting film in other words. Uh, so there's no longer a photochemical process. Okay, they're all shooting video. So uh, we can use these tools. I mean, we can even use the cell phone for its video capabilities. But we can use the cell phone in a way that is cinematic. In other words, we can control the images, control what we show the audience. Um, we can edit and assemble those components. We can um, create scripted content so that it's 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 not random material. It's not uh, reality material, it's, it's scripted narrative material, uh, and we have a series of controls, and we have a series of modalities or methodologies that we can apply to those images so that we are deliberately uh, controlling the message that our audience receives in a way that reflects how, what we felt the tone of our story was, what the principal message was, what any underlying uh, themes were. Um, and we've done that through the, the visual and performative uh, expressive means uh, at, our, at our disposal. All of those things, whether it's exposure or cameras and lenses and lighting and, and scripting and choreography and post effects and all of the wonderful things that we have that we can use to create our cinematic content. So hopefully by now at the end of the semester, what you have is an understanding that cinema is something that it's, um, it's precognitive, it's deliberate, it is. Uh, it requires skill and knowledge, acquired knowledge. Um, it is a process. It and it is a process that is organic. It evolves over time. So you uh, you enter into a uh, an understanding of this modality, and then you experiment with it. You share it. You collaborate with others uh, while using it. And over time, your notions of it, your application of it, um, and your mastery of it will evolve. It will change. It will hopefully improve. Um, and it's something that you will uh, carry with you as a filmmaker, you know, through every experience uh, that you have. Um, so that is the in the broadest sense, I think what, what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about, you know, what my perception of cinema is, okay? Um, people who subscribe to the idea, people that you read about in textbooks and, you know, people who have, um, you know, these lofty conversations on, on YouTube about, you know, individuals who with names that are a mile long and hard to pronounce, um, that are out there doing these things, Tarkovsky and Kubrick and, 
you know, Spielberg and, you know, I mean, you can substitute your, your own preference in there. Um, these are all folks who subscribe, uh, Scorsese, he's a really good example of somebody who subscribes to that cinematic approach to storytelling. In other words, the visual scripted communicative, visually communicative art form that employs all of these traditions and all of these um, skills uh, to make your to make your point. And in this particular class, since we're focusing on cinematography, we talked about the cinematographer being the um, the uh, spearhead of that department of the camera department. Okay, the cinematographer being, you know, chiefly in charge of the visual uh, thrust of the motion picture. Um, so we have a director who is, I like to think the director is somebody who, you know, they, they come into this process very early. Um, they have a, a, a strong sense of what the story is about. Um, they have some idea in their head of, of what this thing uh, looks like and how it's going to evolve as a story. And then they are chiefly concerned with the uh, performative aspects of this story, namely the actors and their portrayals and eliciting from the actors performances that will support um, how this director views this story. And sometimes the director happens to also be the writer, so that um, you know that pro that process can can end up being um, uh, you know two halves of the same sort of um, uh, intellectual contribution, or they can be two separate individuals, right? Uh, and so then here comes the cinematographer who is taking all of that into consideration, and then adding the um, the visual non uh, non uh, um, visually communicative, but nonverbal uh, contribution, right? And this individual has a number of folks that are uh, helping to uh, achieve this end. Okay, I'm checking the chat really quick because I saw my little icon pop up. Um, I'm here, my microphone is disconnected and it makes me quit Zoom to access it. No worries. Okay, I see you, Madison, no problem. Um, and, hey, sorry, I missed my name. No problem, we got you. Okay, um, good. Okay, so what I wanna do now is see if I can get you guys to see my, uh, my screen. So, share screen. Do you guys see, um, if I bring up the deck, can you see that now? Uh, I can't. I cannot see it yet. Cannot see it yet. Okay, I got to keep trying at this because this is, um, I'm hitting the share screen icon, but it, there it goes. Yeah, I'm looking for that menu. Okay, good. Um, 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 um. Finder window, iPad gallery, whiteboard, Acrobat. Well, I can show you, for instance, the uh, outline. Oh, desktop. Here we go. Let's, there we go. Okay. So now you guys should see my desktop, right? Yep. Yep. Good. Yes. Okay. Do you see the outline right here? Because yes. I can, good. I can share that as a document, but I'd rather share it on my screen because then what I can do is this whoop and i can bring up the deck from class which is what i wanted to do in the first place so if you remember in our intro class one of the first things i showed you guys was um i talked about the uh cinematographer and i talked about um who that person is okay also showed you, uh, showed you as Nancy right there. And we talked about that individual. I wanna bomb down here to the bottom and show you the photos. So, and here's Roger Deakins. Okay, he won the Academy Award again this year for 1917. There he is hiding behind the camera. 
Um, so here's our department head, right? So here's Roger, here's the director, okay? And so then we got Judy here and she's, uh, she is um, staging herself for the lens so that they can get the framing. It's an over onto the, mat, onto the uh, laptop, okay? And we talked about the positions in the camera department. Um, here's Andy. I talked to you guys about Andy early on in this semester. You guys remember what Andy's job was? Anybody remember? Andy is the first assistant cameraman, okay? So in the, in the hierarchy of the department, we've got the cinematographer, and then we may have, the cinematographer may operate his own camera. I know Roger likes to operate his own camera. Um, or the cinematographer may sit at uh, the video monitor with the director um, and have a camera operator uh, do the actual uh, manipulating of the uh, fluid head, or in this case, he's using a set of, um, uh, he's using studio wheels from Aerie. Uh, he's using a, a, um, a geared head and uh, he's operating the camera, okay? So the DP, the operator, and then the first assistant cameraman. So Andy's right here next to the camera and his job is to just to focus the lens. I mean, that's his principal job. Right, so he's uh, he's doing all the lens changes, whatever whatever focal length Roger decides he needs, and he's expediting those changes. He's also uh, arranging for, for instance, the geared head to get to the dolly grip in the morning, so the dolly grip can mount it up onto the dolly chassis, which you can just sort of see here poking off the uh, the edge of the desk. Um, he's really in charge with uh, making sure that the camera department has all the gear that they're supposed to have, but principally he's there to focus the lens, right? So in the cinematic approach to filmmaking, we don't use autofocus, we don't use um, cameras that are um, controlling that, that feature for us. We're using um, uh, manual focus cinema lenses so that, again, we have that control over the whole process. Uh, and Andy's job is to basically make sure no matter where that camera moves in space, that whatever the point of focus is, in this case, it's, does anybody remember what this angle is called? We're looking over Judy Dench's shoulder onto a laptop. So we would call this an OTS, over the shoulder, right? So he's framed up the OTS and now he's getting the focus this distance right here from the monitor screen to the focal plane, which is somewhere behind the, the lens right about here. And he's gonna change that focus if that camera moves in space at all, okay? Or he's gonna follow the action if, for instance, if, if in this shot, for instance, Judy was gonna stand up and walk uh, around the desk towards the door, uh, it might be Andy's job to throw the focus from the laptop to Judy as she, stands up and turns around and delivers a line to whoever may be standing on this side of the room, okay? So Andy's job here, his principal job all day long is focusing the lens. Here's another first AC. Um, Larry is setting up the wireless focus assist. So you can see how uh, Andy's sitting right next to the camera, or standing next to the camera in this particular shot. He's got a, uh, a focus assist mounted to the camera. It's, um, this is a dual focus assist, so he's got a wheel on both sides of the camera body. And he's just gonna stand there and operate it with his hand. But Larry's got a wireless focus assist because the camera is now mounted in a hot head, okay, or a, or a, um, uh, yeah, this looks like a hot head by brand, uh, on a techno crane. And so this camera is going to be probably way up in the air. The techno crane can extend, uh, I think the one that he's on right here can go about 35 feet in the air. Uh, and so he's got to be able to focus the lens remotely. And so he's using a radio controlled focus assist. So he's just setting it up. He's calibrating the lens that he's got on the camera with the focus assist. You can see he's transferred all of his um, witness marks from the lens to his focus wheel and to his focus uh, module so that he knows where infinity minimum focus are and a few key points in between. So he can, in essence, with the aid of a small monitor, uh, he can focus that lens whether he's standing next to the camera or not. 
And then here's his second assistant camera person, okay? And that person's job is to provide either the head mark or the tail mark on each piece of film that shot. So every clip of film is gonna be ID'd with the name of the movie, the scene number, the take number. This is a camera roll number right here. And, and the digital day and age, we might, this might be a media card number. Um, in this case, uh, it's a camera film roll number. Uh, the director's name and the DP's name on the slate. And then there's some other incidental information down here along the bottom, for instance, the date, um, interior or exterior notation, day or night notation, sound or no sound notation. And then if there's a filter involved, there is also a small box down here where you can indicate the filter that's being used on that particular shot. And since this is a um, this is a milky plexi slate, okay, you can see how it's it's white, but there's like a shadow in the middle of the slate. That's because he has his camera report taped to the back side of that slate, and on the back side of that slate, he's going to transfer all this information to that document. It's a document that is in triplicate, so he's going to have uh, scene number, take number. Um, he's going to have a brief description of what that scene was, any notation about um, special processes or filters um, that might be involved with this shot or with this camera roll or with this camera card. Um, any, any notable information relevant to the camera um, that he wants to make sure the editor gets at some point, excuse me, is going to be on that camera report. So the second AC's job is, is um, it's inventory of the um, unused media, whether that's film or cards or whatever. Uh, it's cataloging of every shot with critical information. And he keeps track of that throughout the entire film. Um, in the digital era, if he's using data cards, he makes sure those data cards make it to the DIT, who then copies all of that information and, and disseminates it to the producer, the editor, uh, the PR department if necessary, um, uh, a server as an archive, uh, color correction and visual effects, right? So the second AC now in the age of digital filmmaking is really in a very important liaison um, between the day-to-day -day workings of the camera, the DIT or the digital imaging technician who is cataloging, copying, storing, disseminating, and color, in some cases, applying LUTs or color correction, um, and then the production office and all those individuals that are interested in seeing what we're doing on set every day. So the second AC is really a pivotal role here um, and very important to guys like Andy because Andy spends his entire day next to the camera and, you know, Aside from, you know, the occasional bathroom break, Andy used to smoke, but he doesn't smoke anymore. Um, lunch, um, you know, or uh, maybe to make a phone call to call the lab or call a rental house to order a new lens or something like that. Andy's standing right next to Roger all day long with the camera. So the second AC becomes a super critical part of that process because this individual now can uh, ha be hanging out with uh, the first AC on set. He can run out to the camera truck to talk to the the loader or the um, the uh, the media asset person on the camera truck. He can talk to the DIT. Sometimes the second AC can run to the production office if they've got to uh, pick up a fresh box of film or some uh, something that's been shipped to the production office. Um, for the camera department like a new lens or some new data cards or whatever. The second AC is not quite pinned down to the set like the first AC. So he's got a little bit of freedom there. In the film context of what we do, in other words, the photochemical mode, um, we have a loader and the loader is responsible for filling these magazines. This is a, this looks like a 400 foot magazine for uh, the Panavision Millennium. Uh, so he's uh, responsible for uh, loading the fresh film into the magazines. Um, then the second AC catalogs what gets shot on those mags. Here's a roll number right here. When those mags get shot out, a 400 foot uh, roll of film only lasts about um, you know, a little bit under five minutes. Okay, 
So I used to think of it as four minutes, 400 feet, four minutes. And then you'd have a, a hundred feet to sort of play with there to, um, as a fudge factor. Uh, when this mag gets shot out, the loader's gonna take it to the camera truck or the dark room on the sound stage and download the shot and exposed footage, recan it for shipment to the lab, uh, and then uh, lo re reload the magazine with a fresh roll of film. Then he's gonna separate those copies of the camera report. He's gonna tape one to the can of film that's gonna follow that can of film to the lab and through the development process. He's gonna hold on to one copy of that camera report on the camera truck, right, as a record of what was shot that day. And then a copy of that camera report is gonna to go to the production office because there's a, a production coordinator in the production office and a production manager that are looking at these things, keeping track of what's being shot uh, and they need a, an ongoing record of this uh, of this material as well. And there should be, I'm trying to think now, um, I think I had four copies back in the day. I had, uh, there was a white copy on top. I kept uh, pink or gold copies on the truck. I put the uh, green copy, I guess it was, it was either green or yellow that went with the can of film. Um, yeah, I think that's it because the script supervisor is also keeping similar notes on the set as well. The script supervisor is uh, watching continuity, right? So things that are happening within the shot, within the frame as we record them to film or digital, making notes about that, making sure all the lines of the script are being recited correctly and in order. Um, and then that person is also interested in what's on our camera reports. Uh, but depending on how many copies I have on a camera report, uh, the script supervisor may get a copy or may just take a look at the copies that I sent before I send them to the office for, for storing uh, and for cataloging. Here's the DIT, okay. Uh, and the DIT is on set, uh, taking signal from the camera. You can see right here, he's got what we call a color parade going on. Can you guys see that okay? Good, I see the thumbs up, excellent. Uh, he's got the color parade going on. So he's looking at the exposure uh, for the signal coming out of the camera. He's tweaking it a little bit with some software. So he's adjusting the curve. He might be applying a LUT to it uh, or whatever. If they're shooting a raw file, uh, he'll put a LUT on it, which is a lookup table which is like a temporary color correction, so that the director and anybody concerned with the image on set can look at a, a rectified image with the correct exposure and the correct color balance. And then he's piping that to whatever monitors on set require that. He's also burning a copy for himself. He's also copying data cards and hard drives coming out of the camera and arranging to disperse those to the concerned parties at the production office. Uh, he's doing a bunch of stuff here. So the DIT now in recent years has become an important part of this process uh, for the digital capture, the digital acquisition uh, workflow. Here's the Steadicam operator. The Steadicam operator is also, um, uh, in most cases, uh, either the A camera or B camera operator. So in the case of, for instance, this is Emmanuel Lebetsky, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is um, uh, Mr. Inuritu's uh, Steadicam operator. I believe he's the B operator. Here's uh, Emmanuel right here. Uh, so El Chivo likes to operate his own camera, kind of like Roger does. And so this gentleman would be, this is Chris, would be the um, B camera operator when there's two cameras rolling, and when they go to steady cam, Chris uh, takes over the A camera and, and uh, works the camera off the sled. Okay, so the B camera operator slash steady cam operator is, an, is kind of an important aspect of our day to day filmmaking um, process now. It used to be considered special equipment, it was kind of it was rare, it didn't happen every day uh, that the steady cam would appear on set. Um, so it was a big deal when it did, and everybody made sure they were ready for it when it happened. But nowadays, it seems to be a fairly common thing that the Steadicam operator um, is uh, is ever present. And then, of course, we got the camera PA. Okay. 
So the camera PA is either um, an individual who was uh, appointed by the local camera union. That could be somebody who was hired by the production office, uh, or it could be, for instance, um, you know, somebody related to one of the members of the camera crew who is interested in a career in the camera department, and they become involved in that respect. Uh, the camera PA is there to learn, there to help out wherever necessary, um, and eventually is expected to um, join the ranks of the camera union. Uh, and in the United States now, the camera union has consolidated from East Coast to West Coast, and they're all under Local 600 uh, with the IATSE. Okay, so that was the gist of the intro class. Um, it's really becoming familiar with the uh, workings of the camera department, who's involved, um, and so forth. Uh, and then I think the rest of that class, we talked about course objectives and the syllabus and so forth. So um, I'm going to move on now in the outline to our first official section, which were camera basic setups. Okay. And to do that, I'm going to open up a new uh, deck for us to take a look at, which is deck number one. And we'll take a look at quickly the uh, outline for this class. So in this class, we were talking about building your camera. We talk about the capture device, white balance lenses. So the difference between cinema lenses and still lenses. Talk to you a little bit about chip charts and grayscales, slates, camera reports, and then accessories like external monitors, the tripod and so forth. So this is really kind of talking about how you're gonna start building a camera for uh, cinematic production. Um, the uh, emphasis in the beginning of this class, I believe, was the notion that um, you uh, have resources available to you um, to where you can, um, in the case of UCF, for instance, you have a, uh, an equipment uh, facility um, that becomes available to you after you pass this class and as you enter into your production approved classes, uh, there's an equipment department where you can uh, check out cameras, lighting and, and various equipment for your, um, for your classes. Okay. Um, I also talked to you a little bit about um, obtaining that equipment uh, externally. Uh, for instance, um, if you're interested in just some mirrorless gear to get you through a weekend or, or get a quick assignment shot, the UCF library has resources available that students can check out. Um, there's not a lot of it, and because it's um, available to you know, pretty much everybody on campus, um, there's a high demand, so sometimes it can be hard to, um, to acquire equipment through the library, but it is there. Uh, and then you also have the option of um, external sources like rental houses. And I think I've got some suggestions here for you about rental houses. Um, the most important um, takeaway from this initial discussion we had was um, not so much about technique and workflow because we're gonna get in it the whole semester, but which camera is the best camera and the idea that there really is no best camera um, there are a variety of different cameras on the market, and the reason there are is because they have uh, some common and some varying um, capabilities. Um, and so certain cameras are going to have certain specifications or certain capabilities that other cameras may not have. Um, they may shoot in higher resolutions than certain cameras, or they may have high frame rate capabilities, or they might have more accessories available, it might be a more integrated um, system. Um, but whatever, whatever that is, you pick the camera based on the needs of your shoot. Uh, and if you can qualify uh, the camera by clearly identifying what the specific needs of your film are gonna be, for instance, do you wanna do a lot of high speed work? In that case, you're gonna need a camera that can uh, render uh, in high frame rates. Um, 
are you are you going to be able to afford a lighting package or not? If you if you can, uh, you can use uh, the majority of cameras available on the market. If you can't afford a lighting package, for instance, uh, you may need a camera that is um, uh, has a higher uh, ISO selectivity, a uh, camera more sensitive to low light, so that you can get usable footage out of available light situations and not have to add supplemental lighting to your scenarios. Um, so whatever those criteria are for your film, the, uh, the idea is you want to effectively match what your needs are based on that criteria with the specifications of the camera. And when all else fails, the best camera for the job is the one that is available to you. In other words, the one you can access right now or when you need it. Okay, so the idea that um, you would forego shooting or stall shooting or delay shooting in, in some fashion because uh, a certain camera wasn't available to you uh, may not be the best course of action especially if you have a delivery date, like a, an assignment due date, for instance, or a broadcast date. Uh, in those cases, um, you then have to go with the piece of equipment that is readily available that you can access right now, get your hands on right now, um, and go out and shoot your film, okay? So that was the, the main gist of the uh, beginning of week one's discussion here. Um, we also talked a little bit about um, sensors, aspect ratio, resolution, bits and bytes, uh, file sizes, and so forth. So if I just sort of zoom through here, if we talk about the sensor in terms of aspect ratio, width versus height, uh, we, we, noted that we noted that we had a variety of different aspect ratios that we are all relatively familiar with. Um, one to one aspect ratio, which is a square uh, aspect ratio, which is um, uh, it was the initial aspect ratio for cinema a hundred over a hundred years ago. Uh, there are many uh, early films that have a one to one aspect ratio uh, in terms of their projection space. Uh, some of the early Charlie Chapman movies, I believe, were um, uh, Ch Charlie Chaplin movies were one one to one aspect ratio. And recently, uh, there's a few scenes in the um, Grand Budapest Ho Hotel that uh, appeared in projected uh, uh, performances as one-to-one -one aspect ratio. So um, even people like uh, Wes Anderson uh, are still using one-to-one -one aspect ratio occasionally uh, for their films. Um, two by three is a photographic aspect ratio, and it's also a um, a spherical anamorphic aspect ratio as well as four to three. 17 by nine uh, is DCI uh, 4K aspect ratio for the, uh, theatrical projection. 16 by nine is the aspect ratio of your television set at home. And then 21 by nine or 231 uh, aspect ratio is your, um, your widescreen. Uh, one of your widescreen aspect ratios. Okay, here we are just in uh, breaking that down even further. Remember folks that you can go to the um, web courses. And if I just bring it up here really quick, if you go down, for instance, we're talking about week one right now, camera basics. If you open up that, um, hey, open up that uh, web page, um, you'll see that um, you have um, your downloadable PDFs and you also have the videos that you can access here, um, the reading assignments and so forth. So I'm talking about um, this data. Well, there's also um, the, um, the uh, um, the lecture decks. Uh, and to see those, if you go to the course decks tab, uh, there are downloadable PDF versions of all of these decks. So don't forget about that. If you want to see this presentation again, 
Uh, the background won't be dark, so the slide will, will be a little bit lighter in shade, um, but it will be all the same information and everything on those, uh, on those slides. And you just select the deck that you're looking for. They're all on here by this point. Um, oh, I need to put week 13 up there about the uh, gimbals, but yeah, uh, they're all pretty much here and you can download them and take a look at any of these decks again. Okay, just uh, to reiterate. Okay, so this was a graphic representation of what these aspect ratios sort of feel like in terms of their projection area. Okay, so we've got um, 1.33 to 1, 185 to 1, and 235 to 1. Okay, so 133 to 1 is uh, very close to that 2 to 3 aspect ratio 185 is the 17 by 9 and 235 to 1 is pretty close to that um, uh, 21 to 1 uh, aspect ratio okay talking about the area of a photochemical film frame this is a super 35 film frame uh, or what we call 4 perf 35 um, and then you can see how the different capture devices um, from the digital cameras sort of compare in relative field size to what the 35 millimeter frame was. Okay, so we have um, in purple here, <coughs> you'll see that's what we associate these days now with the standard super 35 millimeter uh, image sensor. Okay and it's capturing this amount of image area relative to what the full what we call the full academy aperture was of motion picture film okay so folks who have who are of the opinion that film has higher resolution than digital what they're thinking about when they make that claim is they're thinking about the the comparison of the original academy aperture of 35 millimeter film which is denoted by this black frame area right here. And then the comparative size of the super 35 millimeter digital sensor, which is here in blue. And you can see how there's a lot more area in the Academy aperture where additional detail and resolution can reside. The difference is the Academy aperture has a different length by width dimension to it. So it has a different aspect ratio than the super 35 frame. So while you could say, yeah, the Academy film frame has technically higher resolution than the super 35 film frame, that's only because it has a different um, image area. Uh, and there's some material that's been cropped away from the super 35 aspect ratio um, to give you that more rectangular um, uh, appearance uh, during projection, okay? Um, this is just this is just something for you to think about. Um, I don't really hold you responsible for these specific uh, data points or dimensions in the final exam. It's really just so that you have a sense of what the comparative uh, differences are between the photochemical uh, film stock and the the comparative um, specifications or characteristics of the digital medium. Okay, the digital medium really is, uh, it's, it's all, um, it, it's all um, um, bits and bytes and it's, you know, numeric code. Uh, so there is no physical comparison between a digital video file and a piece of motion picture film. Um, but it's possible to imagine it uh, in this way and understand what the comparative uh, differences are. This is another uh, example showing you the difference in sizes, relative frame sizes of video or uh, film compared to one another. So this little tiny square right here, and then of course here's the Academy aperture behind everything, right? It's this rectangle here that I'm tracing right now with my cursor, okay? That's the original 24 millimeters high by 36 millimeters wide um, image space created uh, 
photochemically inside a film camera. Then you can see the one third inch video uh, comparative uh, data field size for a small video camera, uh, like a camcorder or a, like a Sony Handycam. Uh, half inch video is something like the Panasonic 4K uh, Handycam, for instance, that you see a lot of the uh, YouTubers using. Uh, your two-thirds inch video aspect ratio right here, that's uh, comparatively speaking, that is the size of the image data file that you get out of a, a news camera, a, a video camera for ENG, for instance. 185 uh, is the size of a film frame in Super 35 or, for instance, a RED camera or a Blackmagic um, uh, Ursa Mini. Uh, frame, for instance, um, or a Canon C300 digital video camera. 235 anamorphic is this large square here, okay? And cameras like the Arri 65 are shooting 235 anamorphic. You can also get this out of, oddly enough, the Panasonic GH5. Um, and you can get it out of some RED cameras like the uh, RED. Uh, camera, the, 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 the Red Weapon 6K, uh, and the Monstro 8K will shoot 235 anamorphic. And then Hyper 35 up here, which is what we also call VistaVision, um, and that's what you would get out of either a VistaVision film camera, or uh, you would get it out of, um, there's a new, uh, there's a new um, Red camera that will shoot uh, the VistaVision. Uh, aspect ratio as well. And so you can shoot that uh, with a red camera. This uh, diagram here is talking about the difference between how much space a Super 35 film frame takes up between the sprockets on a piece of film. Um, and it shows you what uh, it's comparing what an image circle would look like in spherical 35 millimeter versus anamorphic where we're squeezing and changing the effective dimensions of the negative space. And we are capturing with lenses that squeeze the image in an anamorphic uh, capture process. And then when the, uh, when the image is projected, it is de-squeezed during projection by specialized projection lenses. That's what gives you, in, in the photochemical process, this is what gives you the widescreen effect uh, for projection that you see when you go and watch a big sky movie like a Western, or um, there were, uh, you know, there's many movies that were shot in anamorphic uh, for their theatrical presentations, like The Terminator 2, for instance, and movies like that. Um, digitally, it's a lot easier. We don't necessarily need anamorphic lenses to squeeze the image and then projection lenses to, to de-squeeze. Uh, we just tell the camera that we want a 2-3-5 aspect ratio uh, and the camera will redefine the image space for you uh, and create image files that have that, um, that aspect ratio that will then, uh, when you pipe that signal to a monitor, show you your anamorphic uh, image frame uh, with the black bands on the top and the bottom, the letterboxing, we call it. Okay, so it's uh, in the digital era, we don't have all of these photochemical manipulations and special lenses that we need necessarily um, to achieve the anamorphic effect. Here's a look at the um, comparative sizes of different um, capture devices um, in different cameras. The little uh, one third uh, inch chip is uh, something that you would find in your cell phone, for instance. Um, the uh, micro four thirds uh, sensor size is somewhere, uh, eh, here it is, micro four thirds right here, okay. Uh, your GH5s and your um, Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema 4K cameras have micro four thirds. Um, you have uh, full frame sensors this size in your Sony A7S III's and your, um, your Canon C700's um, and your Red Monstro 8K or your 
um, Z camera uh, 6K uh, FF um, or 8K FF full frame. Uh, and then the more common size here, the APS-C, which you see in the, it says Canon here. This is pretty close to the size of Super 35, which is what you'll have in your Ursa Mini uh, cameras. You'll have Super 35 in your Canon C300 and 500 cameras. You'll have Super 35 in your Sony FS5, FS7, FS9, I believe. Uh, and also in your Canon uh, 7D and your Canon 60D. Um, you'll have full frame in your Canon 5D, okay? So the size of your sensor is really um, gonna affect the specifications uh, of the camera's sensitivity and low light. It's not necessarily an indicator of resolution uh, because each of these sensor sizes are capable of resolutions up to 4K in these cases and then 6 or 8K in this case. Um, we're barely getting 6K out of the micro four thirds sensor, um, but it is possible. Um, so it's really about perhaps about, I think maybe the only real significant um, difference between the sizes of these sensors might be how your camera performs in low light, okay? Um, the bigger the sensor, the more photosites are on the sensor. We talked about photosites uh, as being these little sort of red and blue and green uh, sensitive areas on the chip that are like little lenses that will take the light and each set of red, blue, and green creates a pixel that contributes to the overall resolution of the image, okay? So larger sensors are gonna have more of these photo sites or they're gonna be bigger and therefore more efficient in low light uh, or simply more of them contributing to high resolution, okay? Uh, I showed you a couple of graphics that um, are corresponding to the sizes of sensors that are in these different cameras that you guys have available to you at UCF. So you can see here, uh, visually I kept the lens ports basically the same in all of these cameras so that you could see the relationship between the size of the sensor and the camera associated with it. Okay, so here's your uh, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K camera and your GH5 with the Micro Four Thirds. You can see size-wise how that compares to the Ursa Mini, for instance. So your Ursa Mini 4.6Ks are gonna have a Super 35 sensor in there. And the Canon C, uh, Cinema Series, the C300s, for instance, also have Super 35 sensors in them. Uh, but the sensor is, again, a little bit larger than what's in the Blackmagic camera. So that's one indication of the difference in the manufacturers of the chip. Okay, either chip in either one of these cameras is basically um, um, created to the same image standard so that you can get the same, for instance, uh, 4K or 1080p image resolution out of them uh, and in basically the same color spaces, which I'll talk to you guys about a little bit later. Um, but there's gonna be some slightly different manufacturing specs because this chip was made by you know, presumably Canon, whereas the Blackmagic sensor was made by a third party manufacturer and then integrated into the Blackmagic uh, Ursa Mini, okay? Um, you can see the relative size between Super 35 and full frame. Again, these two sensors are slightly different. Sony has a slightly bigger sensor than the Canon, but you, if you look, the length by width sort of area look comparatively similar. And so they're gonna have the same re resolution regardless of their slight variation in size. All of this is hearkening back to the, dis this is the exhibition medium that we're concerned with at this point. So if you're going to view your images on projected screens, uh, the aspect ratio might um, have something to do with the um, mode that you're gonna shoot on the camera, right? So if you're gonna look on a computer monitor with a 4-3 aspect ratio and you want your image to be corner to corner, you might select 4-3 image capture in your camera system. If you're shooting uh, 
video for a conventional uh, broadcast television monitor that has a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. If you want the image to extend corner to corner and fill the entire screen, uh, you're going to select 16 by 9 in your um, in your rendering characteristics on the camera and your recording uh, specs. Okay. If you shoot um, if you shoot uh, four three and then view it on a 16 by 9 monitor. Uh, your image field is going to look like this, and you're going to get these black pillars on either side of your image. Okay, all right. I guess this is a 16 by 9 here. Uh, you'll get these black bands on either side of your image because you shot in a 4 3 aspect ratio and committed to an image field that won't fit the 16 by 9 monitor unless you then blow that image up and, and effectively end up cropping part of your image away. Okay, so it's important to know what your exhibition standard is going to be so that when you record your video, you're gonna record it with the proper aspect ratio, okay? Uh, that's basically it. Um, this is a, a graphic that is demonstrating to you at a, at a microscopic level what's happening on your capture device. In other words, your camera is recording an image based on groups of pixels, okay, which we call photosites. Okay, this group of nine right here is a photo site. And you can see that there are uh, green biased uh, photo sites, red biased photo sites, and blue biased photo sites. They are the uh, projection color primaries, okay, red, blue, green. And as the image is recorded in those different color layers, they can be combined and uh, mixed to create pretty much all the colors in the color spectrum, um, the number of photosites you have and the size of the photosites um, can contribute to the number of color variations that can be recorded. Um, and you do that in terms of bit depth, we called it. Um, and we defined bit depth as the number of colors you remember uh, that the camera re can record uh, in the visible spectrum. So uh, a camera with say 8-bit color depth, which is what the basic um, minimum color depth we have for broadcast television, for instance, um, you have RGB in combinations of up to 256 colors. Okay, If you shoot in 10-bit uh, uh, color depth, you have something uh, a little over a little over a thousand different possible color renditions from the uh, RGB uh, mixture in your camera. Okay, the processor is working a little harder to create 10-bit images, uh, and your resulting data files will be um, uh, quite a bit bigger as a result of shooting 10-bit video versus 8-bit video. But you can imagine the more colors you have, the more uh, variation, the more tonal range you're going to have, okay, the more tonal range you're going to have is going to contribute to perceived uh, detail um, and color accuracy. And the more colors you have, obviously, the more uh, refined your image will become, okay. Okay, does anybody have any questions uh, up to this point? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of moving quickly through this, but uh, I want to touch on the points that really that you'll be tested on and spend less time on things that um, are really uh, for your added benefit, but that you won't be necessarily responsible for on the final. Let me switch over here to my... Um, don't want to do that. Okay, I don't hear anyone, and I don't see any hand icons up, so I'm going to assume that that means that we're doing okay question-wise. Okay, bits versus bytes. A little bit of this will be on your final exam, okay? I just really want you to understand the relationship of, of a bit and a byte, for instance. A bit is a binary digit, okay? Um, it's either a one or a zero in terms of data and how it's recorded to your uh, media, to your data card, okay, and then consequently to your image file. Um, a byte uh, is eight binary digits in a group, 
Okay, so photo sites have a total of nine uh, uh, bits in them. It's eight binary digits for your color rendering, and then it's one it's one photo site that is giving you the um, the combined uh, results of the other eight and and rendering it as the um, the true color of whatever that object was, okay? So bits and bytes, a bit is a one or a zero, it's a binary digit, and a byte is eight of those, okay? Byte with a B-Y, bit with a B-I-T, okay? For every kilobyte or megabyte or gigabyte, we're, we are multiplying by a factor of 1,024, okay? So bytes, eight bits to a byte, there are 1,024 bytes to a kilobyte, Okay, if we multiply that again by 1024, you'll get a megabyte and then a gigabyte and then a terabyte. Okay, factor of 1024. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we do? We went uh, kilobyte here is eight times 1024 or 8192 binary digits. Okay, that's how many, that's how many bits are in a kilobyte. 8,192, okay? Bit rate is how quickly your camera records this information, and for instance, in a second, okay? Um, which that's, what known, that's what's known as a bit rate, okay? And cameras that shoot at very high resolutions uh, most of the time are also going to have very high bit rates um, to accommodate that high resolution because a high resolution image is an image that has a lot of detail. So a lot of detail is represented by a lot of differences in binary digits, right? So detail is represented by a series of ones and zeros, right? So if you have a blue sky, there are, aren't a lot of differences in tone in a blue sky. So there's not a lot of resolution in an image that has a lot of blue sky in it. But an image that has, um, you know, very little blue sky and a lot of grass and trees and physical details like houses and people and animals and things, all of those different detail artifacts are going to represent more recorded ones and zeros and therefore higher resolution and, and therefore require higher bit rates. Okay. Let's see, what else have we got here? Um, these are just some average, average bit rates for resolutions that you're going to be shooting at. Uh, here's 2160, that's your 4K resolution. Um, the standard bit rates for the video cameras are anywhere from 35 to 68 megabits per second or higher. Um, your 1080p cameras are typically uh, eight megabits to 12 megabits, that's for um, standard broadcast video. It can be, again, much higher if you're shooting high resolution for film, okay? Um, uh, this is a nice comparison here. Your uh, commercial Blu-ray player at 4K resolution. Okay, a single Blu-ray disc can hold about 25 gigabytes of data and it, re and it displays that or plays it at about 40 megabits per second. A commercial DVD plays anywhere from three to 9.5 megabits per second, okay? Netflix streams anywhere from 30 to 60 megabits per second, okay? So you can see how you can accommodate 4K presentation on Netflix because the bit rate of presentation matches the bit rate of the Blu-ray disc, okay? We talked about your data cards and how to figure out how much recording time you have on a data card, okay? We're talking about the different types of data cards. SD stands for secure digital. SDHC is secure digital high capacity, okay? And SDXC is extreme capacity or extended capacity. Okay, most of the 4K cameras that we're using now are using SDXC cards because you need the extended capacity because the 4K files have more bit rate and more bit depth. So therefore the files are much larger. 
okay, a high capacity card, the files stop at about four, four megabytes, I believe. Uh, and there's no uh, file size uh, limitation on an extended capacity card. Okay, so you probably don't want to use an SDHC video card uh, if you're going to shoot digital video um, because your high bit rate, high resolution uh, video files aren't going to fit uh, on the file capacity of the, a of the HC card. You need the extended capacity card. Uh, we also use compact flash cards and our cameras like our photo cameras and our Canon 5Ds are still using compact flash. CFast cards are the next generation of compact flash. It's basically a compact flash card with a, a much, much higher bit rate. Um, and so those cards are going in things like the Ursa Mini uh, or the, um, uh, the Z camera uh, E6 or the, um, well, Red Camera uses their own proprietary cards, but they're basically like CFast cards. Um, so that's a particular kind of medium. Uh, different cameras are gonna use different kinds of medium. SSDs can be used. Uh, the old Blackmagic Cinema camera used the SSD recording media. Um, there's also an SSD module for the new uh, Ursa Mini uh, Pro G2. Uh, SSDs are, in terms of cost per minute, um, some of the cheapest uh, data cards to use. So if you have a, an SSD recording solution for the video camera that you're working with, um, you can save a lot of money on the cost of data cards. CFast are among the more expensive data cards right now uh, available on the market. So if you're using a camera that shoots for CFast cards, uh, that might be a consideration for you on your production. If you don't have CFast cards available to you, like through the school, for instance, um, and you have to purchase them or rent them, it's gonna be at a higher rate uh, than for instance, um, SDXC cards or SSD uh, solid state drives, okay? And some of the cameras will record through USB, uh, USB 3 uh, to external hard drives like the uh, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, like the one I've got behind me right here. Uh, you can record to uh, Samsung uh, high capacity uh, USB 3 hard drives and bypass the recording media slots altogether. So uh, the recording media is gonna vary from camera to camera and brand to brand. Uh, and that's one of the criteria that you might use when selecting the camera for your production is what kind of recording media do you wanna work with or what kind of recording media can you afford or what kind of recording media do you have access to, okay? Talking about the SD cards, these are the most common. Most of the cameras are recording to SD card. So I use this uh, for the demonstration. If uh, you wanna identify all the different things on a data card, it's all information that you need to know when you're choosing your recording media to make sure you get the right card for the work that you're doing. So we've got the brand here, that SanDisk. Uh, the model of the card is the Extreme Pro, okay? And the Extreme Pro is kind of earmarked for all their high resolution or high data rate uh, video uh, devices. Um, they have other cards in the SanDisk line that are not Extreme Pro. Uh, you should avoid those because they're not gonna have the right recording specs for what you're trying to do, okay? Um, we have the type of card, it's an SDXC, so it's an extreme capacity. Uh, and it's a video 30 card, meaning it records at a minimum of 30, uh, uh, 30 bytes per second, uh, 30 megabytes per second, okay? Which is, if you multiply that by eight, 240 megabits per second, okay? Most uh, of the digital video cameras out there uh, right now, um, peak out at like 240 megabits per second, okay? And part of that is because the manufacturers are trying to create devices for us to buy and use uh, that can make ready use of the media that's out there and available without spending a lot of money, okay? But 240 megabits per second might not be 
robust enough for your six or 8K cameras, for instance, uh, or for some of your very high resolution cameras, 4K cameras, for instance, that shoot raw uncompressed video files, okay, like the, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K, okay, behind me. That camera records uh, upwards of 400 megabits per second because it records a high resolution uh, DCI 17 by 9 4K file um, with a bit depth of 12 bits, which is millions of color options. Okay, um, so you want to make sure that the the record speed of your card is quick enough to be able to handle that kind of data stream. Uh, my Panasonic GH5. Um, uh, most of the recording modes, except for one. Uh, fall under the V30 designation, okay? So uh, the read and write speed is right to the left of that data, okay, of that information. 95 megabytes per second write speed, okay? Uh, read speed, I'm sorry. So 95 megabytes, multiply that by eight. That tells you how quickly this thing will uh, read. And then V30 is 30 megabytes times eight, 240 megabits is how fast it will write. This is read speed, this is write speed, okay? And then this uh, is the uh, class of the car. In other words, if you got a one here, there's only one set of brass contacts on the back of the card. And if there's a two here, there's two rows of brass contacts. Uh, the cards with two rows of brass contacts are for only the newest video cameras that are out there on the market. Um, and uh, if you have one of those cameras, like the new Sony uh, a7 III, I believe, uses the, um, uses the um, Mark II cards, um, the Panasonic GH5 will take the Mark II cards, but it doesn't require them because the, the write speed is, uh, is perfectly fine. Um, but this is a way for the data cards to be future proof, right? The new cameras coming out shooting six and 8K that are gonna be able to take data cards the size of an SD card will definitely need the double rows of contacts. So uh, this is just telling you how many uh, contacts are on the back of your card. These are the classes, class three or class 10, okay? Um, this is UHX three, uh, which is a class designation. And this is 10, meaning the minimum this card will write is 10 megabytes per second. If you multiply that by eight, that's 80 megabits per second. If you have a, a camera that is recording underneath that amount, all you need to do is make sure that your card is class 10. Okay, like for instance, a Sony FS5 records at uh, 68 megabits per second, okay, in 4K. Um, that's not a real robust file when you compare it to what the pocket cinema camera is doing at three or 400 megabits per second, okay? But if we roll back our presentation to what our broadcast standards were, and we remember what that situation was, where's my little graphic here? Uh, is it this one? Yeah. Remember, the Blu-ray is only playing back at 40 megabits per second, okay? Broadcast is only playing back at 48 megabits per second to a high-resolution TV, right? Uh, and then 30 to 60 megabits per second for your Netflix streaming content, okay? So a camera that shoots at 68 megabits per second, the logic behind that from Sony was they created a camera that will shoot in 4K resolution, the sacrifices that, it is, that it's making are in terms of the compression of the video file and maybe the, the accuracy of the color, uh, but the bitstream is enough to accommodate the, the exhibition media that you're going to be using it for. So in this case, it's your streaming content at upwards of 58 megabits per second. Okay, so we're matching now the camera specs to the needs of our exhibition uh, media and, uh, and then considering what the sacrifices are for those compromises uh, in, our, in our specs, either from our recording media or from our cameras. Okay, 
There are different kinds of video uh, cards out there. V30 is a minimum of 30 megabytes per second write speed. Okay, remember I'm talking about uh, bytes being 8 bits, so I'm going to multiply 30 by 8. That gives me 240 megabits per second. Camera uh, data rates are in megabits per second, so you have to convert the information from your data card, uh, which is in bytes, to bits, which uh, will tell you whether or not it can handle all the different record modes from your camera. Okay. Uh, the V60 card records at 60 megabytes per second. If you multiply that by 8, 6 times 8 is 48. That's 480 megabits per second. So I, I use V60 video cards in the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K camera because it's recording at 400 megabits per second. And the V60 card will record up to 480. So I have plenty of headroom on the capacity of my card to get the data as fast as that camera is recording it and pumping it onto the media, this V60 card will be able to handle it. Okay, so if I were to show you, for instance, um, I think I got some right here. Yeah, so I'm using a V60 card. Here's a V60 card from LexPro. Okay, you can see it's got um, what's it telling us over here? Uh, it's telling us it's 64 gigabytes of total recording space. Right? It's telling you uh, 150, uh, 150 megabytes per second. 150, okay. This is, they're calling it a V60 card. I don't know if you can see that. V60, okay, SDXC V60. And then you see how there are two rows of brass contacts on the back, okay. Well, the cameras that I'm using currently don't need those two rows. At some point, I may own a camera that requires it, and I won't have to go out and buy new data cards uh, to use in that device. Okay. Okay. So we're talking about the classes. So you had class two, four, eight, and then class 10. You're not really going to see two, four, and eight anymore. I, I think even if you go to Walgreens or, or Walmart to buy a, an SD card, uh, about the only things you're going to find at the minimum anymore is class 10, okay, UHS-1, okay, which is a speed class with a speed limit of about 80 megabytes per second, megabits, I'm sorry, or 10 megabytes, all right. So these cards right here, uh, <coughs> class 10, V10, and it won't say V10 on the, on, the, on the card itself. It'll only say V30, 60, or 90 up here because we know now that V10 is the minimum. So uh, any SD card that's class 10 right now has a minimum write speed of 80 megabits per second. So we don't put V10 on the card because that's like redundant. Okay, but we do put V30 if you need to know that the that the write speed is higher or V60 or V90. Okay, so if you want to calculate how much record time you have on your SD card, you're going to follow a fairly simple process. Find out what the bit rates are for your camera. You've got to know that right off the bat, otherwise you're guessing. Okay. Um, if the bit rate of your camera is 100 megabits per second, we know that a V30 card, UHS class 3 slash 10, will be sufficient. How do we know that? Because the write speed of a V30 card is 30 megabytes or 240 megabits per second. If your camera is only shooting 100, then 240 is certainly plenty of data rate speed. Okay, if we're going to use a GH5 with a bit rate of 400 megabits per second, we'll need a V60 card, which writes at a minimum of 60 megabytes per second, or 480 megabits, okay, to accommodate the write speed of the camera, all right? So the write speed of the card is actually more qualified than the write speed of the camera, which is good. It's always good to have a little bit of headroom on your speed limit of your data card, uh, so that you don't get dropped frames uh, in your video files from your camera because the card can't keep up, okay? 
Next, we need to choose an SD card capacity. Okay, we can calculate the capacity of an existing card based on its total file size. For instance, if we have a 64 gigabyte card, uh, that's UHS class three or V30, and we wanna shoot at 100 megabits per second on a Sony FS5, how much recording time do we have? The answer to that is, you start by multiplying the total capacity of the card by 1,024, okay? 64 gigabytes times 1,024 is gonna give you a megabyte factor, okay? That'll tell you how many megabytes you have. And then you multiply the megabyte value by eight again to get the megabit value, okay, of the total record capacity. Then divide that number by the, uh, by the product of the megabits per second of the camera and the number 60, okay? And you'll, your answer will be, you'll get 87.38 minutes or one hour and 27 minutes of record time on a 60 gigabyte card shooting at 100 megabits per second, okay? Again, this is on the, uh, on the PDF version of the deck that you can download from web courses and you can look at this again. You can look at this whole sequence of frames again uh, to study up on this, okay? I can tell you for your test, I just want you to know the difference between bits and bytes. And I want you to, I want you to know the difference between a byte, a kilobyte, and a megabyte. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you to calculate any data card capacities on the final, okay? I just want you to know that all of these numbers, okay, translate into recording time information um, or uh, the quality of the video files that you can extract from your camera, okay? All of this is gonna contribute, okay? Why do I care? Okay, if you wanna shoot a movie for Netflix, Okay, if you go to the Netflix website, they're gonna give you a list of criteria that you need to fulfill in terms of how you capture your video if you want them to buy and then uh, distribute your content, okay? So they're gonna give you a minimum um, bit rate capacity of your camera or your cards. Uh, they're going to give you a resolution uh, criteria, which is generally 4K, right? Um, they're going to give you a bit depth criteria, right? So broadcast color uh, for television, okay? In other words, the quality or the bit depth of the video image that they record for a football game, for instance, is only 8-bit color depth, which is 256 possible color permutations from your video file. Uh, if you go to the Netflix website and find out uh, what their criteria for color depth are, they'll say the minimum color depth is 10 bit from your video camera. So if you shoot broadcast standard eight bit color depth, which we call Rec 709, uh, and shoot a movie that way, okay, Netflix won't take your movie and distribute it because they consider that a, a, an inferior video file, okay? Now, the Canon 5D is 8-bit color rendering in the recordings, okay? 5D doesn't record in 10-bit, records in 8-bit. The Sony A7S series uh, mirrorless cameras record in 8-bit to the data card. Now, you can send the video signal out of the camera to a separate recorder, like an Atomos recorder, that'll record in 10-bit, okay? And then those files are robust enough for Netflix. But if you record to the data card in the camera on the Sony mirrorless or the Canon 5D, that movie won't show on Netflix, okay? That's why you wanna make sure that the camera that you're using is gonna match your distribution or your exhibition criteria, right? If your goal is to shoot a movie that will then, that you can then sell to Netflix, whether it's a documentary or a feature film or a serialized TV show, whatever it is, you better pick a camera that can give you a minimum of 10-bit color depth, 
a minimum of 4K resolution, and you're probably going to be picking a camera with a high data rate to make sure that those files are nice and robust and they can handle a lot of color correction manipulation, right? The files that come out of uh, a Canon 5D or a Canon, um, uh, a Canon 1DC or um, a Sony uh, uh, A7S II, uh, or even some of the codecs in the can uh, the Sony FS5. Those are all 8-bit color depth codecs, and um, they don't qualify for Netflix distribution. So make sure you understand what your camera is capable of and match that to the needs of your distributor. Okay, that's the gist of this section. Um, that's most of what we covered in the first uh, couple of weeks. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions on that so far that uh, I can address for you now before I move on? If we go to the outline here, so we've covered basically section 1.0 and 1.1, okay? There were some things about building the camera. I've talked a little bit about different kinds of external monitors and your tripod and so forth. That's kind of stuff that I'm taking for granted you, you understand now because we've had so many weeks of discussion on the matter. Um, but if you wanna revisit, you can, like I said, look at the PDF of that deck um, and you can get uh, the explanation again. Um, I have put up, um, they're unpublished at the moment, but I've put up uh, more video lectures um, from mostly the end of the semester, but I did put up the intro uh, video lecture. If you guys want it, uh, I can publish it on the website. Um, but you have enough information from the PDF of the deck and everything on web courses to revisit this content uh, to study with if you need to. Uh, we're talking about building the camera. Um, I don't want to get much more into it at this point. Um, one of the, I see one of the key points I made in week three, though, was about 24 frames per second, okay? That had to do with um, the uh, recording of audio to go along with the video image, uh, or in the, in the days of film, with the film image, to make sure that the lip flap matched visually with what we heard coming out of the speakers in the theater, right? So you've probably seen uh, poorly crafted or poorly produced video where, or badly edited video, maybe on YouTube, for instance, where somebody's talking on the screen and you see them talking, but the words you're hearing don't seem to match up with the way their mouth is moving. That's the lip flap I'm talking about. Um, and what was determined in the early days of the film industry, once uh, the audio technology uh, was perfected and adopted for filmmaking, uh, they decided that the proper frame rate for the camera uh, in order to make the lip flap match the audio was 24 frames per second. Okay, that's where the 24P standard comes from. Um, it was the best looking frame rate for uh, films that had an audio component uh, instead of just being a silent film, okay? If it's a silent film, um, you, can re you can project it at anything from 16 uh, to uh, about 32 frames a second. Um, and, you know, the image might look a little faster or a little slower uh, in terms of the motion of objects or characters on the screen. Uh, but you're not worried about syncing up any audio. The minute you have dialogue, the minute you have audio dialogue soundtrack with your film, you got to be at 24 frames per second, okay? Okay, in week four, uh, we talk about media management, camera reports, copying media, and so forth. If I bring up the, um, the deck for that week, talking about um, digital asset management at this point. Uh, 
the major takeaways that I had for you guys for this week were um, the notion of camera reports, which I've talked about already. Okay, the idea that we're cataloging all the information that's going on when we're shooting our film. Okay, and for every scene, for every shot, uh, for every minute of film we're recording, we have information that will ultimately maybe become metadata, but we have information on all that stuff. All that information is going to the editor, okay? So that the editor knows all the specific details of any clip of film that, that they have on their desk, in their possession, for when they're cutting the movie together, okay? So camera reports are gonna tell an editor how many, how many scenes were shot on a particular piece of media. Okay, or how many scenes were shot in a day? Uh, on that day, how many scenes were shot? How many data cards does that represent? Or how many rolls of film? And what shots are on what piece of recording media? Okay, what scenes and what shots are on each data card or on each roll of film? Okay, the camera reports are uh, helping us understand that, get a good, a big picture of where all our assets reside. Um, it's just information management, okay? How we organize that media in post-production is gonna be really, really important. Also how we organize that media as we record it and gather it and extract it from the camera and then start depositing it on hard drives or on servers, okay? So the organization of our files was a key topic of discussion this week. Um, I showed you a couple of different types of software um, that you could use to manage that um, that uh, that pro that project. Okay, we talked about separate hard drives, and we talked about uh, uh, archival tapes that you can lay back to for permanent storage of your video. And then we talked about um, the organization of networks at the studio level, uh, and I showed you things like. Uh, the camera and its content as it's recorded and processed. It's sent to color correction. It's sent to uh, the archive for storage, okay? There's a central server involved with all of this, okay? That central server uh, is um, discussed back here in the... Um, the next generation production workflow report that was generated by the Producers Guild in conjunction with, uh, I believe it was Sony, or Sony did their own version of it, I guess. Warner Brothers, I'm sorry. The next generation production workflow report was talking about how we allocate uh, the assets on a major feature film now. Um, smaller feature films don't necessarily concern their themselves to this degree with how assets are gonna move around uh, a company. But when you're shooting for Warner Brothers, for instance, and you're shooting a $200 million movie, there's gonna be a lot of hands and eyes that want access to that data for a variety of reasons, okay? And so um, we're talking about uh, the arrangement of the workflow uh, in a situation like that. So this little device right here in the middle is called the SAN, okay? And this is the um, studio area network, okay? This is the server, okay? And the server gives all these different departments access to the data at the same time so they can do their various things with the information. So we're on the set and we're doing, you know, the next Pirates of the Caribbean movie, let's say. Um, you know, the cameras are out here creating the media, right? We're out in the middle of the desert or we're out in the Bahamas shooting or whatever. We're shooting, you know, enormous 4K or 6K files at 400 megabits per second, recording it to all this media. The DITs are copying the media, creating storage copies and uh, information copies for the production managers and the PR people and so forth, sending that data to the server for storage, the server, and then sending data to the archive for studio archival storage of our footage. 
uh, they're sending uh, content to um, departments that are going to do um, color correction, departments that are going to do uh, visual effects, departments that are going to do PR. Um, the directors uh, are going to want access to this content uh, so they can watch uh, what they've shot uh, at night in their hotel room while they're planning on what they're going to do the next day on set. Um, the producers who are back in LA who didn't travel to the location are also going to want copies of, of the content. They're going to want to see what we're doing to make sure that uh, their, uh, their money is being spent well uh, and that the product that we're generating is, is worthy of their investment. So you're going to have producers that want to look at the material. Um, you're going to have... Uh, uh, who else do we have here? We got people that are going to need files ultimately that become, uh, we got DVD burner here. Uh, before the movie's over, we're certainly not going to burn the DVD, but what we might need is content that needs to go to uh, a company who's going to make a trailer for our film, right? So a lot of times trailers come out months before uh, a film is done being, uh, being made uh, so that the PR department and so forth can start generating audience interest in this film and expectation uh, so that when we finally get it done and edited and packaged and, and distributed, uh, they'll already have an appetite for it. They'll be chomping at the bit to see our film because they've been hearing about it for months. They see it as a preview on the screen when they go to watch uh, the movies that are currently in distribution. Um, so there's a lot of folks that need a lot of access to film at this major studio level. And the, the central focus in all of that is the network. Okay. So, or I'm sorry, the server. Okay. This whole thing is the network, right? And at the center of it all is the server. Okay. So this is a process that the studios had to get together and figure out, uh, before they were willing to accept digital cameras as their principal mode of acquisition, okay? So remember we talked about, um, in, uh, in this week we talked about the, um, uh, the uh, camera asset assessment series, okay? So we talked about in 2009 how uh, the studios got together and about um, 150, 200 uh, technicians and creatives from the industry from all different levels got together. They formed up, up into uh, 10 groups of people. Uh, they all had uh, cameras from different categories and different complexities within the industry. Uh, and they were um, taking those digital devices and they were inserting them into um, some uh, mock uh, exercises like um, film set scenarios and they they did everything um, the way they would do if they were shooting film okay in terms of lights and sets and you know art direction and all of that uh, they created 10 different scenarios and then instead of using a film camera they used one film camera as a control right in, in other words they had one film camera recording as sort of a benchmark and then they had nine digital systems that they put into each of these scenarios and recorded the scenes as though they were using a film camera to see if the, you know, if the video could measure up to the expectations of the one control, the film, the film camera, right? And so they did this in 2009 and then they did it again in 2011, 2000 and late 11, early 12, I guess. Um, they did it a second time. Okay, so they they had the camera assessment series in 2009. They learned a bunch of stuff. They had a bunch of, of material to look at and analyze and data to consider. Uh, they worked out some, some things. They figured out some workflows. And then they went back again in 2012 with uh, informed, with data to compare, uh, with some improvements by some of the manufacturers on some of the devices that they discovered needed upgrades uh, based on the 2009 uh, tests. Uh, and then they attacked this process again, basically the same way. And they came out with uh, a couple of different reports. So like I said, Sony did their own 
uh, assessment series and then Warner Brothers spearheaded the assessment series for the Producers Guild and they came out with this document that um, was talking about how the new digital workflow, how the new digital generation was going to, how that workflow was going to compare to film and was it going to be economically basically the same uh, is it going to integrate into the economics and into the studio structure of how movies are made? Uh, if so, how? If not, how? Uh, and this report uh, became very important for a lot of studio executives to consider when they started making the choice to move from film acquisition to digital. Okay, So not only did the industry and the professionals in the industry have to accept the digital uh, equipment as a new standard, but then they had to prove to the studios that it was viable as well. So the studios, they're the ones investing all the money. The studios would be confident uh, that this process was going to replicate the, the efficiency and the quality of film, okay? What was the major takeaway from this week? Um, and then there was, uh, we talked a little bit about um, some software options that would help you uh, to organize uh, your footage. Uh, those uh, were presentation videos here uh, using the post haste uh, free software that you can download from the internet. If you go to the Digital Rebellion website, the link is on web courses and the video, this video is also on web courses. Uh, you can watch uh, the video about um, the cost effective and free option for handling all of your content uh, when you're in a post-production situation, okay? And when you're, when you're in a physical production situation, gathering all that content, and then when you go into post-production, uh, this post-haste software uh, is a way of managing all those assets so that you can keep them organized. Uh, you can find clips right away. You can, you can locate uh, scenes and, and shots very readily by integrating your camera reports and your files, your file structure and how you store it. Uh, and how you organize all of that on your hard drives, okay? So that was the takeaway from week uh, four, which was we call digital asset management, okay? <clears throat> Anybody have any thoughts on that? Are we all good uh, in terms of what those concepts are? and how we want to approach these problems uh, for ourselves on things like student projects. Okay, I'll, I'll keep moving then if you guys are all good. Because the week, the, the week that's coming up next here, section 2.1 was exposure. Um, now I'm still getting worksheets from you guys um, as you, uh, you know, as you determine whether or not you need a little extra help if you missed a quiz or something. Uh, in the course of the semester. So this is something that should still be relatively fresh in everybody's mind, okay? Um, what I'll do, um, I can open up the exposure deck, but really all I wanna show you is the, uh, the worksheet itself. Um, I think I've got it in the deck though. Yeah, there it is. So this is it. Um, the gist of this conversation was about the relationship between your camera's aperture diaphragm, okay, which is that that diaphragm inside the lens that is um, controlling the amount of light that passes through the lens at any given moment, right? I don't know if you can see the, the diaphragm in here as I close it and open it. You can see how that that, so, that that aperture gets bigger and smaller, right? We call that an aperture because all an aperture is, is an opening that light's gonna pass through, right? But the numbers that correspond to that aperture size, we call f-stops, okay? And so those are what we're setting on our lens, okay? And the relationship was, um, in terms of exposure, we have a, a few things going on. So we've got uh, a camera that's recording in a frames per second mode. 
we have a lens that has a diaphragm in it with an opening that's allowing light to pass through it. Uh, and then we have um, a couple of other incidental things um, that are going to uh, be involved in our exposure. Yes, Jan. Unmute. There Sorry to interrupt, but some of us had asked questions to the chat. Was that okay? Oh, I have to pull that tab up. Yes, let's address those really quick. Let me see. I don't see my chat tab for some reason. What happened to it? Maybe I got to bring my. Uh... I don't. In this mode, in screen mode, I don't see the chat tab. So if you do have a question, just go ahead and there it is. OK. Uh, what do we got here? What's the difference between 23947 and 24? Technically, nothing, Saul. OK. Uh, 23947, it's uh, 2398. Um, in digital terms, yeah, C239, um, is the electronic equivalent of 24 frames per second. In other words, the, the, there's a, a way in which the, um, the processor and the capture device are communicating, and it has to do with the frequency of the electricity, OK? You don't get a pure 24p rendering of that image, okay? You get a a fact a factor of 24. It's almost 24, but electronically, there's a little bit of phase difference between switching the signal on and switching the signal off. That very very minute period of time is what's reflected by this decimal. Okay, but for all intents and purposes, it's 24, and we use 24p and 2398 uh, interchangeably, uh, and you wouldn't be wrong. Okay, this is just the exact way of denoting it. Okay, but I, I'm pretty sure at this point there are no true 24p uh, recording devices. Okay, that aren't film cameras. Okay, the only, the only devices that were actually 24p were film cameras. It was 24 frames per second, okay? But when we recorded uh, film uh, for TV shows, for instance, um, we had to make sure that our cameras were phased to match up with the electronic interval uh, that the broadcast equipment was using. In other words, the frequency the equipment was running at and so forth. And so we used to have to get these Cine Electronics uh, um, uh, crystal bases for our cameras, apply those to the camera, and then phase the shutter to operate with these very minute differences in frame rate. Because broadcast television is technically running at 30p, and our film cameras were running at 24p. So what we had to do before we had the the, the current digital cameras, it's, it's, a, it's a simple matter of changing the shutter speed uh, adjustment on the camera. But for film cameras, we actually had to use an electronic device that would phase the shutter to be the equivalent of an electronic shutter speed that would match up with the broadcast electronic standard. So 2398 didn't come along until the progressive scan televisions were available and the digital cinema cameras became available. But in the 80s and 90s, when it was just television broadcast, um, we had to phase the shutter of our camera to either uh, uh, 2398 or 2997 um, so that the electronic um, standard of the broadcast equipment would match the rate of filming rate of our camera. Okay, but you'd be right either way. Saying it either way is, is is fine. Nobody will fault you for it. In fact, a lot of people sort of don't even remember that twenty three nine eight is the, you know, technically correct way of expressing it. They just say twenty four p for short because we all know that it's basically the same thing. Okay. Uh, the Netflix criteria, uh, if you want a f your film to be picked up by Netflix, it needs to be a minimum of 8 bits. No, minimum of 10 bits. 
okay? Uh, if you go to the Netflix website, they, they have navigation that will lead you to their criteria, their camera criteria. And on that um, page, it'll tell you what cameras are approved by Netflix. Uh, and if your camera is not on their list, they have a base set of standards that they require uh, and they'll list um, 24p and 10 bit as the standards for their camera acquisition. Um, camera needs to be able to shoot that minimum, 10 bit. 8 bit is fine if, um, if you're shooting, like say you're going to shoot a commercial that's going to go, that's going to air on television, right? Um, uh, television will allow 8-bit because their whole ecosystem is only 8-bit. It can't be any bigger than that because they have to squeeze a lot of data into their broadcast signal uh, before they pipe it, you know, through the air and along the cables to all their different networks, right? So there'd be too much data at stake if, if broadcast uh, standards were 10-bit. So the broadcast standards are only 8-bit, okay? Um, so if you're shooting for TV and it's not involving high quality streaming like Netflix is claiming they provide, uh, then 8-bit is fine. But Netflix wants 10-bit. Um, companies like HBO, for instance, like if you were shooting Game of Thrones, okay, they're still going to be shooting 10 or 12-bit images because they want they want to create data that they can archive and if the broadcast standards improve 10 years from now uh, they'll go back to the archive and they'll and they'll recreate game of thrones at a higher resolution or a higher uh, color um, depth to accommodate the new broadcast standard that's called future proofing your content right but in order for it to play in 2018 19 and 20 right Technically, it only had to be 8-bit, but if your original footage is only 8-bit, it'll never get any better than that, okay? But they shot 12-bit uncompressed raw on Game of Thrones so that 10 years from now, if they need to create, you know, the content all over again for distribution for, you know, they want to replay their content on HBO for a 10-year anniversary, let's say. Uh, they could lay it back in 10-bit um, for the new broadcast standard, and they would be, you know, current and up-to-date in terms of quality. Presumably, TVs will be better 10 years from now, and the whole, everything will be better technologically in 10 years. So we want to shoot our, our source footage with the highest quality possible to accommodate future distribution needs, okay, or exhibition needs. Uh, about making sure the bit rate is good for your films. Is there any way that you can change or fix it through editing software like Adobe Premiere? You can scale down, but you can't, you can't scale up. Okay. If you recorded in eight bit color depth with a Canon 5D, um, you could, you could use that footage in a project file that had a 10 bit spec but all that does is import 8-bit content into a 10-bit uh, workspace. It doesn't turn 8-bit into 10-bit, okay? In other words, if there's only 256 color permutations possible, then importing it into a work project that has 10-bit spec, all it's gonna do is like double up on the numbers, but it's not gonna create new colors that, that weren't there in the original file. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. So that's an important thing to remember, right? And resolution works the same way. Um, if you shoot, uh, or if you, have a, if you have a 4K TV, for instance, um, and you hook up a DVD player to it, okay? Not a Blu-ray player, a DVD player, okay? The TV is 4K. The TV could show you a 4K file if you had it, but the DVD player isn't showing you a 4K image. The DVD player is showing you an HD image, a 1080p image, okay? Now, 
you can play that DVD on your 4K TV. It'll look great because you'll see every possible detail that was in that 1080p file. But you're not looking at a 4K file because you're watching it on a 4K TV. Okay, it's still only a 1080p file. Now, if you hook a Blu-ray player up to your 4K TV and it's a 4K Blu-ray, then you're looking at a 4K image. But you can play a lower resolution on a higher resolution TV, but that doesn't mean that it instantly becomes a higher resolution. Okay, is that a better way of thinking about it? Okay. Uh, that looks like all the questions I had from the chat. Thank you for pointing that out to me because uh, I have to open up a sub tab in order to see that on my screen now. Uh, okay, so we were talking about exposure. Um, the relationship between your aperture, your frames per second, right? Um, and your camera's sensitivity to light or your ISO, okay? Those are the fundamental. Those are the big three involved in exposure, okay? And then I've got ND filtration up here as well, okay? Um, but that kind of works part and parcel with your f-stop. In other words, it's a filter that goes over the lens. So, that fil so if the f-stop is governing the amount of light coming through the lens, and that is balancing with the frames per second and the sensitivity to give us an exposure, then anything we put in front of the lens is kind of working part and parcel with the f-stop, okay? And we, we had a way of remembering what ND filters are. I used a very simple analogy in class. Does anybody remember what that was? I see your hand up, Jen. Is that from the last question or is that? In that response? was from the last question. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so we called ND filters. We, we, we compared those to sunglasses, remember? So it was like putting sunglasses in front of the lens. The only difference is sunglasses are arbitrary, right? We don't know how thick or thin sunglasses are, but ND filters are calibrated. So an N an N three uh, an N D point three filter, okay, is a one stop reduction in the amount of light passing through that filter. So if I had if I showed you an N D three filter, okay, here's an N D three filter. You see that light splashing on the back wall behind me. The camera is seeing that that light, you know, raw. If I hold the filter in front of my web camera, you can see what happens, right? It's like putting sunglasses over my over my web camera, right? And this thickness, right? If I have a white card here, that'll help. The density of this filter is one f-stop right so we have nd.3 nd.6 nd.9 nd1.2 nd1.5 nd1.8 each time we jump a number like that we're adding an f-stop of of reduction to the amount of light passing through the filter thereby passing through the lens, right? Does that make sense? I think, do I have page two here? I don't know if I do or not. No, I don't. On your worksheets, okay, there is a page two that shows you the ND filter relationships. Okay, I've also got it on the web courses PDF. There's a downloadable document here. Let's go to the home page. <clears throat> and let's go to the section on exposure. Uh, where is it? Here's the whole sheet. I've also got for you here, here's your depth of field, shutter speed relationships, aperture and F number, 
exposure triangle, I guess you're going to have to look at it here. Okay. On page two, you can see, everybody see this okay? Uh, here is the ND filtration comparison, right? So you see N2, N4, N6, N16, okay? These are ND number notations. Uh, I'm on this column over here. The film guys talk about ND filters in terms of 0, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, and 1.2. That's just a multiplication factor. It's the filter factor of the uh, ND, the amount of reduction. You can see on this first column, though, it's telling you uh, how many, or I'm sorry, the third column, is how many f-stops of reduction those filters have, okay? On your worksheet, it's using fractions to correspond to f-stop reduction. On a filter, like if you rent filters from, uh, if you go to Panavision and rent neutral density filters, uh, you're going to talk to them in terms of 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18, okay? Um, because that's how Tiffin uh, speaks about neutral density filter factor, okay, or Schneider or um, uh, Format or um, B and W, all the different filter manufacturers. They talk about uh, ND filter uh, in terms of 0 0.369, 1.2, 1.5, and 1.8. Um, all you got to remember, and you got this little chart, if you keep this chart handy, N3 is one stop, N6 is two stops, N9 is three stops, 1.2 is four stops, 1.5 is five stops, and 1.8 is six stops of reduction. One set of sunglasses, two sets of sunglasses, three sets of sunglasses, four, five, and six sets of sunglasses. All right, each layer of density adds or subtracts one f-stop of light, okay? On the worksheet itself, we have variables like the ND filters, the aperture, the ISO, which is your sensitivity, the shutter speed, which remained constant through the majority of the worksheet, and then your frame rate, okay? The takeaways here in terms of exposure is remembering how all of these variables need to balance so that you can create a good exposure. And then from that baseline, whatever that good exposure was in terms of the settings, you can mix and match the variables to create different conditions within that set of variables that will achieve different results for your image while maintaining proper balance in terms of brightness and contrast, okay? So if you have, uh, if you want to function at a given f-stop, right, and you set your camera up for the correct um, settings to give you the right uh, brightness in terms of the image on your screen, and that looks fine to you, but you find out you're at f11, and you realize that you want your background to be out of focus, well, you can't. You can't use an exposure solution that uses F11 as its, as its um, baseline because you have too much depth of field, right? Small f-stops have more uh, in focus than uh, smaller numbers, right? So you might want to go to a 2.8 or a 4, so your background will be out of focus. But in order to do that, some of the other variables have to change, right? So you, this, is, this worksheet is trying to show you how the different variables will change. And the way to work this sheet was simply to look at the baseline and understand this was the initial exposure. In other words, imagine a, 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 you know, a pastoral scene. We don't even know what the scene was. But the settings on the camera were the following. 1 16th ND filtration at an f-stop of a 4 at an ISO of 800 and a shutter speed of 1 over 48 and a frame rate of 24p, right? Then I ask you to rework the baseline in some way because some portion of the solution changed. So like in the example here, we see that 
the ISO went from 800 to 1600. ISO being the sensitivity of your camera. If you look at the ISO chart on the second page of your worksheet, you'll see that cameras can come uh, with a variety of ISO situations that you can adjust on the camera, okay? Um, every camera that's out there that you'll use has one specific ISO that it calls its native ISO, okay? That means the manufacturer built that camera and they were considering one of these naturally occurring ISOs as the baseline sensitivity for that camera. And most of the cameras that are coming out currently have a native ISO of 800, okay? Some cameras have a native ISO of 3200, like the Sony FS5 and Sony FS7, um, the Sony A7, S2 and 3, the Sony A7 III, um, they have native ISOs of 3200. Uh, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K has two native ISOs. It has a dual native ISO of 400 or 3200. And you can pick which one you want to work at, okay? A low ISO rating means the camera is not as sensitive to light as it would be if its ISO were 3200, okay? And how this correlates to the camera is basically how much current is going to the capture device, okay? So the capture device is um, getting exposed to light. It's uh, creating uh, digital uh, image files from the light coming through the lens, okay? Um, it's doing it at a certain rate, okay? Um, and it's doing it at a certain sensitivity to light, okay? So if you have, if your camera has a base ISO of 400, then it needs, it needs an above average amount of light to create a properly balanced exposure. If you don't have plenty of light in your situation, your images are probably gonna look dark. And you can solve that problem in a variety of ways. You can pick lenses that have very big maximum apertures that can let in a lot of light at one time. Um, you can use supplementary lighting, okay? Add to your scene to bring up the level of light in the room or to add light in the appropriate amounts to your subject to make them look appropriately exposed. Uh, or, you can increase the amount of power going to your capture device. And you do that by raising the ISO of the camera. And most cameras will have a native ISO, and then they'll have a couple of choices that'll make it more sensitive and a couple of choices that might make it less sensitive, right? Like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K has a base ISO of 400, but you can also adjust it from 200 to 1600 within that one matrix, okay? And then if you switch to the higher sensitivity matrix, 3200 ISO, you can achieve anything from 800 to, uh, I think it's 6200 uh, or 12,600 ISO uh, based on the higher sensitivity matrix. So you can adjust the sensitivity of your camera. We talked about a specific drawback of doing that though when you manipulate how the sensor is receiving current from the camera. Does anybody remember what that resulting uh, problem was? Do you remember me talking about noise? You can get grain in the image. Yeah, okay. Well, if it's film, we call it grain. If it's digital, we call it noise. But yeah, it's basically a graininess or a gritty, dirty looking uh, quality to the image where there are areas that didn't get enough light for the camera to be able to create a clean, uh, well-balanced image, okay? If you are shooting in really, really low light situations, you wanna be able to adjust your camera to a high ISO but the trade-off is the higher you go in ISO and the less light that is available, the 
the less perfect the image will be, it will be really, really grainy because there will be portions of the photosites or the film grain that just isn't getting ample light to have a reaction take place, which turns into either digital information or um, detail on your negative, okay? In either situation, um, high ISOs will generate grainy, noisy images, which may look okay and they may not look okay. It depends on the brand of camera that you use and the quality of their uh, signal to noise rendering, okay? Uh, some electronic noise looks very natural and it reminds, it's reminiscent of film grain, which doesn't necessarily bother uh, folks terribly because we've been looking at film grain our entire lives until the last 10 years, basically. Um, so in some cases, the electronic noise looks a lot like film grain that we're already sort of pre-sensitized to and, and, and we have, a, uh, we have a, a relative acceptance for it. And some digital noise is just ugly and, and doesn't look attractive at all. And it's very distracting and it, and it can degrade the image considerably. So we have to be very careful about the choices we make in terms of raising the ISO on our camera. It's far better to add light to a situation to get the exposure to look more properly balanced. It's a far better solution to do that than to just ramp up the ISO on the camera until the electronic meter says that's okay because the results uh, will be completely different. When we add light to a scene, we can add light in a way that we can control the shape, we can control the color, we can control the intensity, uh, and we can balance it out in a variety of ways to make it look very natural. And in some cases, depending on how we shape it, very compelling. Uh, the quality of our lighting can add to the tone of our story uh, in a way that adds value to the uh, visual experience. Um, just simply ramping up the ISO won't do that. All it will do is make it possible for you to shoot in a lighting situation that is something other than ideal, okay? So the best solution is always to allow your camera to function at its native ISO or at a low ISO and then add light where needed in order to, to create a good looking exposure, okay? Uh, sometimes adding light is as simple as cracking open the aperture on our lens to a bigger size, okay? But if we can't achieve a lens opening big enough to properly balance our image, at that point, we need to start adding light, okay? And you can use your camera's monitor or, or an external monitor on set to gauge the difference uh, when you're adjusting the camera to decide whether an image looks too bright or too dark uh, and so forth. You can also use a light meter uh, to calculate your exposures. What did I do with my light? Oh, here it is. Um, so, if you're using a light meter, the light meter is going to give you exposure information in the little liquid crystal readout, right? So, I take my lumosphere and I extend it out and I point the meter at my light source and it tells me what f-stop to plug on the camera on the lens based on the frame rate and the ISO that the camera wants to work at. In this case, I have it set to 800 ISO. You can see that in the upper corner here. And then 24p, 24 frames per second. And the light that I'm using to light myself today is 28 and it looks like 28 and a third. Okay, so that would be if I had the ability to adjust the exposure controls on my webcam. Uh, I would know that the lens was set at a two eight and a third, right? If I'm setting that on my film camera and I have my cinema lens, I would just set my T-stop to two eight and a third, just like that, right? So two eight and a third is somewhere between two eight and a T-stop of four, right? So I can use a light meter. Uh, to figure out my results that way. The light meter, light meter will tell me how much light is present in a space, and then I set the camera accordingly. 
I'm using something called the exposure triangle, which I have a document for you guys, a PDF that you can download and look at, right? Um, <clears throat> it was, let me show it to you here. The exposure triangle. This document explains how to balance the variables so that you have a properly balanced exposure. So you remember here it was aperture, ISO, and shutter speed, right? Or frames per second. And this triangle is the relationship between all of those principal variables, right? If you change the aperture, something has to happen to these two in order to balance your exposure. If you change the ISO, something has to happen to these two things in order to balance your exposure. But I gave you guys a, a quick tip, which was how to shortcut this process um, and only have to worry about your apertures, right? Let me go back to the exposure triangle. Oops. All right, so we had the triangle, aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. Okay, if you're recording dialogue, what does your shutter speed have to be on your camera? What's your frame rate have to be? 24. 24, okay. It can't be anything else, right? Because if it is, the lip flap doesn't match the audio. And it looks like the person is saying words but the audio is not lining up, okay? Like a really bad kung fu movie, right? So if you lock your camera's shutter speed at 24 frames per second, and then you go down to your ISO, and you realize the manufacturer recommends that your camera be set at 800 ISO, you can lock that variable in. So that means the only variable you gotta worry about is your aperture, right? So you take your light meter, you measure how much light is present in a room. If the light meter says you need to be at a 2.8, but your lens only opens up to a four, then you probably need to get a new lens that'll open up to 2.8, or better yet, open up to a T2. If you can't do that, you can come off your base ISO, okay? If your lens will only open up to a T4 and you need a 2.8, a 2.8 is one stop brighter than a four. So your ISO will have to change from 800 to 1600. You'd have to double it, right? And then everything is fine and you can go ahead and shoot and your exposures will come out perfectly balanced, okay? So the exposure triangle, what it's trying to show you are the, the sacrifices you make by changing each of these things and it reminds you that it's all a balancing act between the three principal variables involved with exposure. <clears throat> if you lock these in to their baseline requirements, okay, you'll get good lip flap, reasonable motion blur, and no grain at native ISOs, then all you gotta do is worry about your aperture. Your meter will tell you what aperture your lighting is okay, or what aperture your lighting requires, and then you just set your lens accordingly, okay? If you, <clears throat> if you have a lot of light and your meter is telling you to shoot at an 11 and you don't wanna do that because you want nice, soft, out-of-focus backgrounds, that's when you need your sunglasses for your lens. That's when you need your ND filters, all right? If you like the look of depth of field at a T28, but your light meter is telling you that you have T11 worth of available light in the room, you can <clears throat> turn off some of your lights. You can make the room darker. You can put ND filtration on your lens, or you can close down your, your aperture to an 11. The solution you pick is really up to you. If the room call, if the if the scene calls for a brightly lit room, day interior, uh, uh, we're shooting a Jane Eyre movie, okay, 
and it's a period piece and everybody's sitting around the parlor and the settee and they're all talking about politics and, and philosophy. We don't want it to be a dark room. That wouldn't look right. So it has to stay a bright room, but we don't want to shoot it at an F11 because then there's too much depth of field. So maybe we'll put ND filters in front of the lens so we can shoot with a little bit nicer depth of field <coughs> and manipulate our image that way. If you understand all the variables of exposure, you have that kind of creative control over the image at that point. That was the thrust of this conversation. The basic exposure process in terms of digital is an image that we light, that illumination enters the lens, it's controlled by a diaphragm, the light is focused onto a capture device which is divided up into a bare matrix that digitizes the image, <clears throat> records the color and detail into a digital file that goes into a processor and it gets compressed data-wise until it fits on an SD card. The process is fairly simple, it's linear, um, and it is what's happening every time we create a digital image with our digital uh, motion picture camera. Okay. In the following week, we talk about filtration. And it's just an extended conversation that goes beyond neutral density to include things like color correction um, and polarization uh, or uh, linear enhancements like um, graduated filters and so forth. <coughs> the best way to address that is to go to my YouTube page and check out the filtration videos. There are five of them and the investment of time will be something like an hour all in total, but it's broken up into uh, smaller bites so you can watch it, you know, over time if you want to. Um, and I talk about all the different types of filtration and all the different uh, ways of uh, adapting the filters to your cameras and what those options are, uh, what they look like, and what the results uh, can provide. Okay, that would be the best way I think to capture to tackle this question of filtration. Remember, there was a really nice video from Ira Tiffin about the five. Uh, most necessary filters uh, in your kit, what they are and what they do. <clears throat> He's talking about the uh, optical flap for protecting the lens, the polarizer for working in intense uh, outdoor sunlight uh, to intensify colors and reduce reflections. He talks about diffusion filters to soften up the detail of an image to give it a, a kinder, gentler looking contrast. Um, and he talks about graduated filters uh, for shooting in uh, principally exteriors where the sky is extremely bright and the foregrounds uh, are unlit or darker in contrast. And uh, an ND uh, graduate filter helps you to balance out a bright sky with a darker foreground. He covers that in that uh, video fairly nicely. Um, we talk about neutral density filters in the complete range of f-stop reduction from one stop all the way up to six stops of reduction, um, how they fit in a matte box, okay? I've got a matte box here as an example. Uh, this one happens to be uh, a 16 by nine matte box that will hold four by four filters or uh, four by five filters, depending on what aspect ratio you're shooting, okay, um, or what format you're shooting. Whoops, these are uh, adapter rings to adapt it to the front of our lens. Uh, my four by four tray doesn't want to come out for, the, for some reason. Oh, there it goes. Here's your four by four filter stage, um, or four by five filter stage, depending on what kind of filters you use. If you shoot a lot of wide format stuff, um, you might want four by five filters. Um, I've never needed anything bigger than four by four glass myself. Um, 
four by four filters uh, look like this. And this one happens to be a chocolate grad, which is a little hard to see here, but um, what I do with my white card, there it is. The uh, chocolate grad has a slightly darker top than on the bottom. And you can see how if you wanted to darken up a sky and color it slightly warm, uh, like the opening uh, sequence of uh, Top Gun. Remember I showed you guys the opening scene of Top Gun uh, was done with um, coral grads. This is a chocolate grad, by the way. A little bit different, a um, little bit different color effect. The, the, coral, the coral grad is a little bit warmer on top. This one happens to be a little bit browner. Um, more like an antique or a sepia kind of effect. Um, but it's just for uh, a little added exposure control and some really nice creative effects as well. Um, that was the thrust of this week's talk on filtration. So it was uh, the different types, whether it was cut glass or whether it was um, resin um, or whether it was um, gelatin or round filters, okay? Uh, they're all different means of attaching to your lenses. It's really about connectivity at that point. Um, a matte box seems to be, I don't know if it's because I, you know, I cut my teeth on this stuff when I was very, very young in the film industry, but it seems to me that either the, um, the resin solution with the filter holder or the matte box solution tends to be the most flexible because at that point, uh, if, if you buy, um, small round screw-on filters to uh, fit on your lenses, right? Uh, this lens here happens to have an accessory size of 77 millimeters. You can see it uh, at the, uh, the bottom here. It says 77 mil. That's the thread size of this front of the lens, right? Well, this one happens to be 77 millimeter but I might have one that is, you know, 82 millimeter, or I might have one that is, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, this one I think is, is uh, 50, I think this one's 52 or 55 millimeter, right? It's quite small, right? Um, you'd have to have filters for all these different sizes, right, of lenses, uh, and that becomes okay. expensive and problematic to have that much stuff in your in your uh, equipment arsenal or in your gear bag so one set of filters that's one size fits all and a matte box or a filter frame to hold it seems to me to be the most intelligent solution to the problem because your investment is only one set of filters right and then you just use rings uh to adapt the uh, filters to the front of your lenses of different sizes, uh, the same way with the matte box, right? With the matte box, you just have uh, different size rings to adapt the matte box to the front of your camera, or in the situation with uh, the digital cinema cameras, we have rod base that we use, uh, and the matte box attaches to the rod base, and there's no rings involved at all at that point. Um, the <clears throat> matte box simply hovers in front of the opening on the lens mounted to the rods beneath the lens which are the same rods that hold your focus assist uh, and then you put your filters in the filter stages of the matte box and you know that seems to be the uh, the most convenient operative way here's the rod bracket on this particular matte box right um, here's a matte box on a a GH4, a GH5, right? It's attached to the rod base, right? So we've got the, let me turn it this way so you can see the focus assist. So you got the rod base, uh, which holds the focus assist, right? And the matte box, and everything's attached to the camera. And then this whole mess attaches to the tripod down here. You attach your tripod quick release plate to the rod base, or the rod bed, we call it. Uh, and this becomes the form factor for your camera to accommodate all the different accessories that you want to use while filming, right? <clears throat> so here's a matte box. This one is, uh, this one looks like the uh, Red Rock matte box. 
um, and it holds uh, the basic Red Rock box holds uh, four by four filters. You can also get a version that holds four by five filters if you're shooting um, 6K or 8K um, uh, uh, wide format, anamorphic or Vista format. Um, digital. Uh, you might want 4x5 filters in a 4x5 box. If you're shooting standard 16x9, you can achieve that easily with 4x4 filters and a 4x4 matte box. So the type of matte box that you choose, um, it might have some there might be some personal decisions uh, involved with that. Certainly price. I mean, there some map boxes are out there uh, cost you an arm and a leg and some map boxes are out there uh, and they're fairly reasonably priced. Uh, and usually the difference in quality has to do with more or fewer plastic parts. Um, the robustness or the solidness of the build, um, the size of the filter trays, four by five map boxes are more expensive than four by four map boxes. Um, whether or not you need or the existence of rings is going to have, uh, you know, determine the value of the box. And that results in a higher rental or in a more expensive purchase price. Uh, at UCF, <clears throat> they have boxes um, that are uh, four by four standard, but have four by five filter trays available so that you can use four by five filters if you need to. Um, but the cameras and everything that are at UCF that you guys will be able to check out for the next year or two are, um, are all fully functional within the 4x4 glass filter ecosystem. So um, that's about it for filters. There's more to it. You can look at the PDF of the, uh, the lecture. Uh, just understand the difference between ND filters. Um, understand what a filter factor is if you're using polarizers. Um, or ND filters, the factor is how many f-stops of reduction occur as a result of using that filter. Some color filters are so dense uh, that they have a filter factor which will actually affect your exposure controls. Um, so filter factor is something you want to know if you're using really dense filters like NDs or polarizers or um, uh, really dark color correction filters like um, blue color correction filters uh, generally can deduct as much as two stops from your exposure solution because of the, the darkness of the filter itself. But most color correction filters uh, that you add for creative enhancement uh, have relatively little or no effect on your overall exposure solution. Polarizers are for reducing glare uh, from a scene like the glare on the water of this uh, particular brook or reflections in car windshields or windows uh, in storefronts, uh, windows in houses and so forth. If you wanna shoot a shot of somebody in a car with the car window rolled up, you're gonna get a lot of reflection unless you use a polarizer or open the car window. Uh, sometimes opening the car window is an easier solution, um, but if it's not something that's likely to occur in that story or something that the character is not likely to do, and you need to see clearly through the window, you need a polarizer. Polarizer will also increase the saturation of colors within a scene because it's fixing and removing all of the diffused or stray light vectors from uh, the image and only giving you the ones that are coming directly through the lens at the proper uh, parallel vector. Okay, so that makes, that, that gives colors the appearance of being more, um, more saturated, okay? Uh, moving on, we had, um, we did our lighting discussions for a couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> the main takeaways from the lighting discussion was understanding the three-point lighting process <coughs> that it involved <laughs> three principal fixtures, a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. The key light provided the main source of illumination, uh, established the exposure, established the color balance, 
and created the shape or texture of your subject by virtue of its placement, okay? <clears throat> the fill light was a fixture that you added to the key light to supplement what the key light was doing. And the role of the fill light was to control the contrast by how deeply the resulting shadows from the key light registered on your subject. So if you had an extreme side light coming in on your subject and virtually no reflected light on the, on the low side, we had a deep shadow here, you could add a fill light and raise the level of that shadow to anything from complete par balance, one to one, or half of the intensity of the key light, or a quarter of the intensity of the key light, or an eighth of the intensity of the key light, okay? And have a one to one, two to one, three to one, or four to one ratio between the key light and the fill light. The edge light was simply a light that you <clears throat> applied to your subject from behind the subject to create enough of a bright outline on the profile to separate your subject from the background, okay? If your subject has plenty of separation from the background by virtue of a difference in contrast or brightness, you might not need an edge light, okay? It all depends on what you're shooting, what your circumstances are, what kind of set you're dealing with, whether it's day or night, interior or exterior, okay? We also talked about color temperature. We talked about the color, the quality and color of light indoors with indoor fixtures versus outside or fixtures balanced to work outside. Uh, LEDs are balanced principally to work outside or they can be adjusted to work in either environment, indoors or outdoors. Traditional uh, Hollywood motion picture lights were always balanced for indoor use and that color balance was 3200 Kelvin and it was kind of orangey. Uh, daylight uh, sunshine is about 6,500 degrees Kelvin, and that's a bluer quality of light. Um, LEDs tend to be balanced for that blue uh, lighting that we see uh, outside, uh, although some of them are what we call bicolor, and they can be adjusted for their output to be either orangey or bluish, depending on what kind of prevailing available light you have. <coughs> Coming up in the, in the week before the break, we talked about composition um, in terms of um, pattern, repetition, balance, proximity, hierarchy. Uh, we talked about vanishing points. We talked about the rule of thirds. Um, I think the rule of thirds is your biggest takeaway from that week. And that was the notion that we could divide up the motion picture frame into zones, right? And we could, uh, if we placed information at those points of intersection in the motion picture frame, we could create focal points that would be, our audience would be naturally drawn to. Okay, so you, do you remember the, um, this diagram right here? If we took the standard 16 by 9 frame and we made a tic tac toe board out of it, right, we have four points of focus that result from all these lines of intersection. And when we put things compositionally at those intersecting points, it naturally draws the audience's attention to those focal points. So we talked about Mad Max here and the fact that. He was captured by the uh, sand people and uh, he still had his face mask on with the chain, but he managed to grab a gun and he was going to uh, negotiate for or fight his way free. And the cinematographer who was John Seal put Max in the right upper one third focal point and the gun in the upper left, which balanced the frame horizontally left and right and it gave weight to the top of the frame, top and bottom, and created a focal point for the gun and a focal point for the expression on Max's face, uh, indicating that he's, at this point, all business, right? 
We talked about the spaces created by the rule of thirds, how there was negative space and positive space. <coughs> we talked about the implications of having objects in the lower frame or objects in the upper frame being positive or negative uh, aspirations, like um, horizons in the top of frame tend to be more positive and the bottom of the frame tend to be more negative. We talked about um, the golden uh, ratio, which was based on the Fibonacci mathematical sequence. In other words, our eyes are drawn to particular parts of the frame. The theory behind the golden ratio is that our eye scans the edges of a frame first and it works its way in towards the center. Okay, so if we apply the Fibonacci mathematical sequence to the golden rule, it gives us a scan pattern for our eyes that starts in a corner and works its way around the edges, concentrically working its way towards the center of an image. We showed how it worked with images like the Mona Lisa and uh, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, and it also worked with uh, uh, Kubrick and his Full Metal Jacket. <clears throat> We talked about coverage, we talked about wide shots, medium shots, and close-ups and what they were good for. Close-ups for uh, performance and the conveyance of um, minute details in a story. Medium shots as being shots that showed us basically uh, what, you know, who's involved in, in, uh, in an exchange and what the basic, uh, exchange is about without too much fine detail and then the wide shot shows us where we are and how many people are involved or what location we're in okay and then we compared a bunch of the uh, images from mr robot to uh, support the ideas of compositional arrangement and what was happening in each of these particular uh frames right <clears throat> then we had our spring break. After the break, we came back and we talked about coverage. The main takeaway with coverage was the, the notion that when we're shooting film, we are collecting a series of images that we're going to string together into a scene, and that that scene is going to represent a story with a narrative uh, that we hope the audience receives in a predetermined way. Okay, so shooting coverage was all about gathering the pieces in the right kinds of compositions and in the right kinds of uh, patterns and sequences so that we can cut them together uh, in an editing sequence and create a scene that flows nicely uh, as the audience watches and participates in our story. Um, we talked about different framing solutions that um, are classic forms of coverage. Uh, we talked about close-ups. We talked about uh, wide shots. We talked about long shots, medium shots, split two shots. We talked about different forms of the close-up. This was a standard close-up. We talked about a loose close-up, we talked about an ex uh, a big close-up, and we talked about an extreme close-up, different sizes that denote different kinds of action. This is a really serious moment where we see only eye performance from Michael Fassbender so that we understand just by seeing the performance of his eyes how serious he is and how intent he is on reaching his objective. Uh, in this big close-up, we see only Robert Downey uh, inside the Iron Man helmet. So we can see his level of anxiety uh, as he is encountering his, uh, his nemesis. We can also see all the details that he is managing inside the visor of his helmet when he's inside his Iron Man armor. This is uh, Captain Marvel, and this is a standard close-up. We see enough of her uh, facial performance to understand what kind of a mood she's in, but 
we frame it nicely so that we don't have a lot of competing detail in the frame. We see only her close up in performance. Give her a little bit of a haircut here and a little bit of a, a bottom cut here along the, along the chest. And this is what we call um, a, a loose close up or a two button close up as opposed to this one, which we might call a necktie close up because the knot on our Windsor knot of our necktie would be right at the bottom of the frame line and a little bit of a haircut, okay? We talked about some specialty shots. Um, namely, uh, we talked about um, Dutch angles. We talked about, um, we talked about the heroic single. We talked about the split two shot. Okay, being a profile like so. We talked about a reflected two shot and we talked about multiples. This is a three shot. This is from Reservoir Dogs. They open up the trunk. The trunk represents the POV of the guy inside that they have got bound and gagged. And they open up the, the boot of the, of the car to reveal the three shot of, <clears throat> who is this? This is, uh, this is uh, Mike. And this is um, Steve uh, and Harvey, and they are going to beat the crap out of the guy that they just uh, dragged over to the warehouse in the back of their sedan. Right? Um, we also talked about the, um, the director's line and what it represented in terms of the proscenium and how we want the camera to be on the same side of the proscenium line for each of our pieces of coverage, whether it's an over the shoulder or a complimentary over the shoulder or a split two shot or a wide shot, okay? The same point of view that the audience has sitting in the, in the seats watching the show, right? So we don't want the camera to have any angles that represent a point of view the audience won't have, like something behind the proscenium line as though from backstage, right? That wouldn't make sense to the audience because they're all out here in the cheap sheets uh, watching the movie, like, or watching the stage play, I should say. So the director's line is all about what we call the proscenium and keeping all the points of view on the same side of that proscenium so that the audience doesn't lose track of the spatial relationship or the geographic relationship between subjects in a frame, okay? We talked about inserts and we talked about POVs, okay? An insert being a very great close shot that gives us uh, access to detail that we wouldn't see in a wide, and a POV which shows us the state of mind or shows us what uh, a character is seeing or experiencing uh, subjectively and how these can be very effective storytelling tools. Um, and then lastly, we talked about unique angles like Dutch angles and high point of view angles uh, where we see the world from uh, unique points of view that we rarely get to engage with um, and putting the camera there, what's involved with putting the camera there and what those results might look like. The Dutch angle and its effect on the audience, using it for moments of subjective uh, confusion um, or uh, when we want to show a distorted mind state of our subject, we can have an active Dutch angle which moves with the scene and shows us how the, uh, uh, the character might be feeling. And then I showed you some videos that put the whole process together. <clears throat> um, in terms of the camera movement stuff, I think that's uh, material you guys can address uh, on your own by watching the um, recorded lectures that I have for movement, because I'm showing you uh, devices in the process of explaining what they do. And so for, the, for our reasons of review here, I think it's not as efficient to go over that material again. Plus it's the most recent stuff and you've just seen it. So I wanted to focus more on the content that you guys got in the beginning of the semester to sort of refresh your memory show you where it was so you can reaccess the information. And if you have any questions for me, we're running out of time now, but you can certainly send me an email if you've got any unanswered questions at this point. Um, or we can arrange to do a Zoom meeting uh, privately uh, as well. So let me know um, whatever mode uh, you wanna work with. 
if you've got uh, outstanding questions or concerns, let me know and I'd be happy to go over the content with you, okay? Does anybody have any questions before I let you all go? Because I have a section two Zoom right after this. Um, but does anybody have any uh, anything they want to address right now? You're going to post this um, on web courses, right? Yes, I will. All right. So basically, um, the best thing to do to study for the final exam May I ask is review the questions from the quizzes if they're still open and sure. go through all the definitions and notes? Yeah, um, what I'll do is I'll go through and make sure all the quizzes are open now so you can access the answers and see all the responses. Um, you'll have all of the documents from web courses that you can reopen and download at your leisure. Um, all, all of the lectures that you guys got um, for the last uh, four or five weeks, I think, are up on web courses. You can rewatch those. Uh, you got PDFs of the others uh, for these uh, these uh, lecture decks. Um, and yes, of course, you know you can reach out to me uh, at any point this week if you've got any questions beyond that. I'd be happy to help. Sound good? Yes. Yes. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for coming. I appreciate your time. And um, give me a shout if you've got anything you want to talk about outside of the review. Otherwise, uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you all around the LMS. And then uh, don't forget about your, uh, your final next week. It'll be online and it'll open on the 27th. Okay? Okay. Okay. Right, thank folks. you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Stay safe. Stay healthy. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.